Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Star Cells and God. This is the podcast where we explore some of the discoveries that are happening at the cutting edge of science and describe what these discoveries mean for God's existence and the reliability of the Christian faith. Uh, I am a biochemist and a Christian apologist, and I work for an organization called Reasons to Believe, which sponsors this podcast. If you want to know more about Reasons to Believe, I invite you to go to our website, www.reasons.org. Also, uh, make sure you follow us on social media, RTB underscore official. And then last but not least, go to our YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe One, where you can access all kinds of great video content exploring a range of science faith issues, including star cells and God. And when you're there, make sure you subscribe and set the notification button so you will be alerted to the next time an episode of Star Cells and God drops. And also make sure that you share this podcast with your friends. Uh, I have the pleasure of being joined uh, today by Dr. Cy Gart, a biochemist and uh, uh, a bit of a Christian apologist himself, although I'm not sure if you'd use that moniker. Uh, Cy is a good friend of, of mine and a good friend of Reasons to Believe, and he's joining today as a special guest on our uh, ep uh, on this episode of Star Cells and God. So welcome, Cy. Glad that you're with us. Thanks. It's great to be here as always. Yeah. So this is like, I think, your third time uh, joining us, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, some of the, 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 the past two episodes we recorded together, in my mind, were just tremendous. So I encourage people to, to take a look at those past episodes. Uh, one of them, I, you tell your story, at least an abbreviated version of your story, of how you came to, to faith in Christ. And, and we discuss a little bit about science faith models. And in, in another episode, you talk about some work that you did looking at uh, the origin of self-replicating systems. Right. So great stuff. I, and again, encourage people to take a look at this. Uh, today, we both are going to talk about some new discoveries. I'm going to be talking about work dealing with uh, new insights into LUCA, and you're going to be talking about uh, the question, what is missing from evolutionary theory? So uh, uh, this should be, uh, I, I hope, uh, uh, an enjoyable episode for our viewers. Uh, Sai, I'm going to go ahead and get started with, with my discovery, if that's okay with you. And uh, uh, I, I'm just going to ask you a, a quick question as we get started, not to put you on the spot. I don't know if you have grandchildren or not. Uh, you do, he's nodding your head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, my wife and I actually have 10 grandchildren. Wow. Uh, they range in age from about one and a half to, I think, nine. And and Christmas and birthdays are a lot of fun for my wife and I, because as doting grandparents, uh, we just shower our grandkids with uh, useless toys and gifts, you know, <laughs> that we we go way over the top when we do it. We We don't care. We have a lot of fun with it. And, you know, it's interesting to to watch our grandkids unwrap their presents at Christmas or on their birthdays. And, you know, invariably my wife and I choose toys for them that require assembly. Right. And when a kid gets a, a gift and that, and they're re and they're excited about it and they want to play with it right away. The worst thing in the world for everybody involved is that there's assembly required. It right. just puts the pressure on, and, you know, my wife and I are pretty good about reading directions before we get started. It's just something we both do. But invariably, those directions underestimate the complexity of the of what's going to be required to put that toy together. So the, the instructions aren't always as helpful as you might like. Well, th the reason I, I tell that little story is because, in a sense, this is the, the same kind of problem that life scientists and original life researchers have when they try to reconstruct or to assemble what they think Luca would have looked like, uh, the last universal common ancestor. And Luca is a very important concept in evolutionary theory. This is envisioned to be uh, a, a single cell entity that roots uh, the evolutionary tree of life. 
and the way in which people have tried to gain insight and understanding into the biochemistry and the physiology of LUCA is by using life's instruction manual, using genetic information harbored in DNA, where they try to reconstruct the genome of LUCA and from that gain an understanding about the, the nature, the characteristics, the properties of LUCA. And a recent work uh, published by this team of collaborators from the UK and the US, uh, a work published in a, a, a preprint service called BioRxiv, uh, uh, takes a different approach to characterizing LUCA, looking at the, the physiological and the biochemical properties of LUCA as opposed to the instruction manual. And what they end up discovering is something uh, unexpected, that LUCA is far more complex than anybody could have imagined. And so as I, uh, before I describe the work that they did and unpack some of the scientific and maybe even theological implications, it might be worth just spending a minute uh, doing a quick review of, of what LUCA is for people that are not familiar with, with that concept. This slide gives a, 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 a depiction of what LUCA is. And here in this diagram, we see LUCA being represented as uh, a, a single cell entity that's giving rise to the two major domains of life, the two major evolutionary branches in the tree of life, bacteria and archaea. And then the also so shown in the diagram is this idea that bacterial cells and archaeal cells would have fused together in a process called symbiogenesis to create eukaryotic cells that then give rise to the complex multicellular organisms we're all familiar with, fungi and plants and animals. Now, it's important to note that LUCA is really uh, connected to the origin of life as well. I see LUCA as, as, in a sense, that transition between the formal process of uh, the origin of life and biological evolution, where it's the end of the origin of life process and the beginning of biological evolution. And so from an origin of life standpoint, uh, you know, the, this is a, a slide that gives some sense for where LUCA is positioned in the origin of life process. And uh, this is slide is uh, giving uh, preference to an idea known as the RNA world hypothesis, where the idea is that on the early earth, there would have been prebiotic materials that would have formed, let's say, in the earth's atmosphere, at volcanic emissions, maybe at hydrothermal vents, and that, <clears throat> or maybe delivered to the earth through some kind of panspermia mechanism, and that these materials would complexify over time uh, and begin to aggregate into protocellular entities that, according to this diagram, would have probably employed RNA as the very first biochemistry, and then later the DNA protein world was invented through evolutionary processes, ultimately giving rise to this cell called LUCA. Uh, but it's important to note that from an evolutionary perspective, LUCA is not considered the first cell, but rather the, the, the population of cells that anchors the evolutionary tree of life, that many scientists believe that there were cells that preceded LUCA that are sometimes referred to as progenotes, and that there may well have been contemporary populations of cells with LUCA, where LUCA happens to be that one lucky uh, cell type that uh, was able to anchor the evolutionary tree of life, or it anchored the evolutionary tree of life, not because it was lucky and it was the outworkings of a historically contingent evolutionary process, but rather because it actually had properties that allowed it to outcompete other cell types. Uh, my sense reading the literature is today, most people think of LUCA as a single cell type, and this is because of the universal nature of biochemistry. But uh, there have in the past people that have argued, just for the sake of completeness here, that LUCA may not have been a single cell type, but a, a community of cells. Uh, 
that uh, were exchanging genetic material through horizontal gene transfer, and that instead of LUCA being a single cell type, actually was a coalescence of this community of cells that then gave rise, you know, to uh, branches that we today understand as the archaea and bacteria. So anyway, this is uh, just a quick overview of of the the different ways that people think about LUCA. Now, one of the areas of of interest among uh, origin of life researchers and, and life scientists is what is the nature, what is the character of LUCA? And the approach that uh, people have traditionally taken is to look at uh, life in, life's instruction manual, to look at the informa information found in genomes and try to reconstruct the genome of LUCA. And so one approach would be to build evolutionary trees based on genetic um, information and then try to work your way backward to identify what would be the genome for uh, for LUCA. And depending on the, the individual study, the size of, of LUCA's genome ranges anywhere from about 300 to roughly 1,000 different genes or distinct genes. Uh, other approaches are to look at um, microorganisms that have streamlined genomes, like, uh, let's say, nanoarchaeum or... Uh, 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 gosh, uh, mycoplasm genitalium, which are known to be the smallest genomes for uh, archaea and bacteria, respectively, and then try to use those to piece together what the what the minimum genome might be and what Luca's genome might look like. Uh, but in all of these approaches, the underlying assumption is that Luca was probably a rather simple organism uh, that. Uh, over time, increased in complexity as it gave rise to the major divisions uh, of the evolutionary tree of life. The problem with this approach is that we don't understand how genotype relates to phenotype. So even though you might have what you think to be Luca's genome, you're trying to then take that genetic information and draw inferences about the biochemistry and the physiology of of Luca, and and that's not an easy thing to do because we don't have good understanding of how genetic information relates to the physical biological properties of cells, let alone uh, complex multicellular organisms. And so this research team took a very different tactic, where they used what they called phenotypic data to do the reconstruction of Luca where they were looking at biochemical and physiological traits. And they, I think, surveyed about 3,000 genomes for archaea and bacteria. And, and then from that, identified 28 traits that they were looking at and reconstructed LUCA, concluding that LUCA probably had about 22 specific traits that included things like uh, an active motility, uh, it had a single cell wall, possessed a single membrane, contained a mixture of bacterial and archaeal lipids, which is interesting. It was able to tolerate salt water, uh, though it couldn't tolerate the salinity of a modern day of modern day seawater. Lived in high temperature environments, lived in waters with near neutral pH, lived in an environment devoid of oxygen used inorganic materials as an oxidation source, and was ovid in shape. So uh, to put it in technical terms, LUCA was halo-tolerant, hyperthermophilic, chemolithautotrophic, and an anaerobe. Uh, in other words, LUCA was much more complex than people would have initially thought using this particular approach. And in fact, they estimate that uh, this kind of set of physiological and biochemical properties would have required probably four to 5,000 distinct genes, not 300 to 1,000. So LUCA is uh, apparently on the order of four to five times more complex uh, at minimum than what people have traditionally conceived LUCA uh, as being, uh, which is uh, rather interesting, rather surprising. Uh, now, 
And in fact, the, the researchers argue that LUCA may have been even more complex than a typical archaeal cell or a typical bacterial cell. Uh, and that if anything happened, there was a loss of complexity, excuse me, there was a loss of complexity uh, through uh, evolutionary history. Now, where this gets really interesting, and this is something that the researchers point out, is that when you look at the timetable that people think uh, corresponds to when LUCA originates, and, and the, this research team goes into the scientific literature to come up with this date, they argue that LUCA appears to have originated around 3.9 billion years ago. Now, this is interesting because if you're familiar with early Earth's history, 3.9 billion years ago is the time when the Earth was in the midst of uh, the late heavy bombardment. And, and this is a, a slide that shows kind of the impact history of the early Earth. And what you see here is that when the Earth forms, it most likely is going to be a molten planet, a magma, a, a magma planet where there would be no crustal features on the surface of the Earth. Uh, water would be uh, only present as atmospheric gases, not as in liquid form on the surface. And part of the reason for this is because the Earth was experiencing high levels of impactors striking its surface, liberating so much energy that the Earth, again, would be a magma ocean. Now, the view is that around somewhere between 4.4 and 4.2 billion years ago, the impact events would subside enough that the crust of the Earth could form, that oceans could be established, and this period of uh, a cool, quiet Earth was interrupted at about 3.9, 3.8 billion years ago by something called the late heavy bombardment, where a uh, uh, some kind of gravitational perturbation in the solar system causes asteroids and comets to pummel the inner solar system planets. Now, there is a debate going on as to what was the consequence uh, of the late heavy bombardment for the Earth. Some extreme models say, well, the Earth was rendered in, into a magma ocean again, where oceans were completely volatilized, rock on the surface and the subsurface was melted. Others say, well, maybe only rock on the surface was melted, the subsurface rock remained intact and could have served as a refuge for any life that would have been present on the planet. Other models say that the impactors were, again, liberating high amounts of energy, but it wasn't sufficient to melt the surface of the earth or to volatilize the oceans in their entirety. But either way, you wind up with kind of a, a challenging problem because LUCA is appearing in the midst of the late heavy bombardment under conditions that you would think intuitively ought to be hostile for life, ought to be frustrating events for the origin of life. And if we take the most extreme consequences of this late heavy bombardment, it means that not only did life originate very rapidly, but LUCA achieved uh, almost near instantaneously this remarkable level of complexity. If you go to the other extreme where the late heavy bombardment isn't that uh, damaging to the earth, you still have a relatively short window of time for the origin of life to take place and for these very first cells to evolve the complexity that you see displayed by LUCA, maybe on the order of a, a, a couple hundred million years. Uh, so the bottom line is that this really puts pressure on kind of the standard evolutionary view that LUCA was relatively simple and that the evolution from simple cells to complex cells took place over a protracted period of time. Uh, the researchers um, make this statement in their article, our results have the potential to push cellular complexity back to the very beginning of life. Barring the unlikelihood of panspermia, these results imply that complex phenotypic traits arose far earlier in the history of life than previously thought. Early life may have very quickly evolved considerable cellular complexity. Thus, we reveal LUCA, 
as a potentially complex cell possessing a genetic code perhaps more intricate than many modern bacteria and archaea. So anyway, very interesting because it it suggests that, again, the standard evolutionary view of the origin of life is is probably not correct. Now, I think as a as a kind of a in all fairness, this work has been only published as a preprint. So we want to be cautious about maybe over ascribing the you know the significance to this work. But what is interesting is that even though these results don't fit comfortably within a um, kind of a standard evolutionary perspective, they do f- fit really well in in light of our um, origin of life model that we propose at Reasons to Believe. And, you know, we proposed this model in uh, 2004, where we would take the view that Genesis 1-2 is making a reference or an inference to what we would understand scientifically as the origin of life. And if that's the case, then we would predict that that life should appear very early in Earth's history. It should originate under hostile conditions. It should originate rapidly and that the first life forms would be complex. And with these these sets of predictions, again, fit uh, very comfortably with the insight from this latest work uh, where researchers are attempting to reconstruct uh, reconstruct Luca. So interesting work. Uh, when you talk about, in my view, the sudden appearance of of life in, in that life is very rapidly complex, that to me looks like something consistent at minimum with some type of, of, of divine intervention. What that mechanism of divine intervention looks like is up for debate, but it really does look like something that again involves divine intervention, either that or there's something fundamentally uh, missing in our understanding of of how chemical evolution would proceed, where it's not a historically contingent process, but rather is is something that uh, is fundamentally prescribed into the laws of nature so that life is going to originate very rapidly and attain you know, uh, this this level of complexity very rapidly. Uh, I, I think that's surprising given the mechanisms we have, or at least we understand, you wouldn't necessarily expect that. Anyway, so um, uh, that's all I have to say about that, I suppose. Si, I'm curious uh, your reaction, uh, your thoughts. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating paper. Um, and I, And I'm I'm expecting it will be published, although we'll see. Uh, um, my, I completely agree with you that those early stages of the origin of life, or those stages of the of anything before we get Luca, is very hard to fit into an evolutionary model. Uh, but and I think the timing is part of that, and and we've known for a long time that Luca appeared you know, uh, amazingly early. <laughs> uh, I, you know, what we didn't know is how complex Luca is, and now we do. And it's not surprising that it should be that way, because it did give rise eventually to both archaea and bacteria. But we knew that there wasn't a lot of time for Luca to develop. Right? I'm not saying evolve. And, you know, in one of your slides, it was very interesting, because when you talked about the origin of life, you mentioned that first we had RNA world, and then RNA world went to DNA world, and then DNA world went to LUCA. But none of that could possibly be occurring according to the theory of evolution, because until we actually have LUCA, which means not just DNA world, but DNA world with a uh, a functional genome that can do translation, that can make proteins very specifically, and that can replicate itself with great accuracy. And I'm bringing now, I'm bringing back the the work that I talked about last time I was here, which is that if you don't have accurate self-replication of cells, which can only start with LUCA, you can't have biological evolution because biological evolution requires that any living organism makes very good copies of itself. If it doesn't, 
then you don't get evolution because any change that occurs cannot get passed down with with high confidence to the next generation. So, you know, no matter how complex Luca is or isn't, all the steps leading up to it have to come from some other mechanism. And and I agree. I, in in I mean I I of course agree as a Christian that God created everything and created life, created the world, etc. But I think that one of the things that people like us like to do is figure out how He did it, <laughs> because right. because you know we we're, we're scientists and and we like to find those mechanisms, and we don't and it doesn't look like we're going to be able to find them in this case. Because, as I just said, according to the laws of physics and chemistry that we know, there's just there's no way that you're going to get a, a fully functioning complex cell with 5,000 different proteins, you know, produced by 5,000 different genes by chemical evolution. Chemical evolution can't do that. It doesn't have, you know, what Dawkins, Richard Dawkins calls the crane of evolution, of natural selection, which has incredible power to do things. And the reason natural selection has that power is because a cell that's more fit will pass on, will, will, in, will pass on, will, to, through the generations, the reasons for its fitness, the genotype and phenotype that make it fitter. And it can't do that if it if it's not already like Luca. If it's not already have a membrane, a, D, a a genome of DNA, a protein synthesis system that makes enzymes correctly, and then when it divides, you know that phenotype is carried into the next generation, and you can't get that. Can't get that from RNA world. You can't get it even from DNA world unless all those complex systems are in place. So I I think my view is and is that we need a new, we're missing, as you just said, we're missing something in evolution. And if it and and, and what I was going to talk about later uh is there's a lot missing in evolutionary theory. I mean, I'm a great proponent of evolution, biological evolution. I think, you know, the Darwinian uh, method uh, with current uh, improvements that have been going on since Darwin, you know, is, is, is often usually, <clears throat> excuse me, usually very good ex, uh, explanation, has high explanatory power for describing the diversity of life and the way species form. But there are big, big holes in it. And those holes cannot be filled with anything we now know, like chemical evolution. I mean, chemical evolution is based on the stability of different chemicals, the their abundance, and how they react with each other. And all of that is a function of chance, mass action, and the laws of chemistry, which do not include anything resembling natural selection right because chemicals are not alive so it doesn't matter whether <laughs> whether they die or not that they, they don't they're not you know they don't have kids <laughs> they don't nothing inherits anything about their them so uh we need new laws we we need to understand if we're going to understand how life originated as well as many other things about life including humans which I'll talk about later, maybe. But if we're going to understand how life started, we need to, we need some other tools, yeah, you know, other than the known laws of chemistry. Well, you know, and when you look at things like process structuralism, which right. maybe gives you a glimmer of what the what's missing, you know, from evolutionary theory, you really are moving into. Uh, an arena where things are becoming highly teleological, right. highly goal, goal and oriented and purposeful. That's right. And 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 that's I think that is the key. And and I, you know, I my latest paper in uh perspectives in, in science and Christian faith is about that. And it I talk about and I've had other papers talking about that. I mean, you know, nothing that's not alive has any purpose in itself okay we we may pick up a rock 
and hit something with it. So it now has a purpose for us, but that's our purpose. The rock itself has no purpose, nor does anything outside of life. However, everything that's alive has a purpose, which if nothing else, it's to survive. And that's what gives natural selection its power because the teleology of evolution is to, it, 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 it's, a, it's a tautology. The, the, the creatures that live the best live the best, <laughs> okay? So the, the fittest survive, which is basically saying those who survive, survive. Now, it, it sounds like a tautology, but it's actually, it's true, it's, it's correct, but you've got to have that purpose of survival. And the purpose of survival is there because that's what fuels natural selection. So, you know, eventually that purpose becomes conscious. So animals, you know, really feel like they want to live. They get hungry. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a biochemical why, why do animals get hungry? I, I, I'll tell you a short story, if that's all right. Fonse. Sure, sure. I was sitting on a beach once, uh, not long ago, and I was watching seagulls. And the seagulls are all running around looking for food, you know, and diving and flying. And one seagull is just standing there and, I, and not moving. And I was thinking, well, what if it were true that that seagull never got hungry? What would happen to it? I really, it would die, I mean, right? It would never feel hungry. It would just sit there. Why would it go bothering, you know, looking for things to eat? And it would die. Early on in the history of animals, hunger developed as a survival technique. And, you know, the, the pain of hunger is what makes us live. If we didn't have that, we'd all be dead. We meaning every animal on the planet. So that's an example of an evolutionary mechanism that has the purpose of survival. Basically, you know, it's those first animals that felt some hunger pains went out and actively looked for food. They were probably single bacteria, whatever. I don't know how they felt hungry, but, you know, we have all kinds of complex biochemical mechanisms to feel hunger. And we need it. And there's a purpose to it. And there's a purpose to everything that goes on in life. And that purpose is survival. And that was built in by natural selection. So until you have that kind of teleology, there's no, it's not life. Yeah. And where yeah. did that come from? It's really <laughs> interesting because, because um, you know, what you're describing, I think some evolutionary theorists would, would describe as kind of adaptationism or pan adaptationism, yep. which really, as you're pointing out, does have a, a teleology associated with it. But as I read people who are evolutionary biologists that are more in the theoretical arena, people like, um, you know, FW or what F, uh, sorry, uh, Ford, D F, sorry, Ford W. Doolittle or W. Ford Doolittle. Um, you know, there's a, a book by an Italian philosopher of biology. I can't, um, his name escapes me at the moment called yeah. Imperfections, right? I've had interactions with Niles Aldridge and they very much hold to a view where they would reject adaptationism, right. where they make the argument that evolutionary processes are deeply anti-teleological, right. right? That they uh, they argue that most of the features of organisms really are deeply flawed. They're imperfections. They are evolutionary byproducts, evolutionary spandrels. And <clears throat> that seems to be the conception of, of evolutionary theory that uh, gets the, gra the, the greatest hearing, at least in, from my perspective. And maybe I'm wrong about that. And maybe, you know, this idea of a teleological nature to evolution is gaining more ground than I than I'm aware of but it, it seems like you really have you know very two very different perspectives on evolution at play uh, uh even among evolutionary biologists oh people like yeah. you know uh, W4 Doolittle you know strongly criticize adaptationism in fact their critique of the results of the encode project uh, fall in that line where when you're seeing function for, you know, you know, so-called junk DNA, 
that's very much an adaptationist perspective. Yeah, these things might have function, but it's these are span the function that junk DNA has is a span drill. It's not really something, you know, other than that. And to ascribe function to it is, you know, to commit the sin of adaptationism. So there's almost like a a deep philosophical commitment to anti-teleology, at least among some pretty prominent and highly respected evolutionary biologists. So it's very interesting to hear your comments. And, And I think part of the reason why so many Christians are uncomfortable with the idea that of God using evolution to create is they see evolution being presented in, in an anti teleological way versus seeing it being presented in a teleological way. And I think one of the most extreme expressions of that again is process structuralism, where it's not natural selection that's even determining the outcome. It's the laws of nature are somehow driving things to to specific endpoints. I mean that that's fascinating, and you're right. Uh, but it's what what I think is going on is that there is a branch of uh, evolutionary theory which is anti-adaptationist. Actually, Stephen Jay Gould was anti. But you see, he was not anti-adaptationalist in total. He just said that not everything is adaptation. Because Richard Dawkins and many other earlier uh, evolutionary theorists thought adaptation was everything. Okay. So what Gould said is, well, it's, it is important. Okay. You'll never get rid of natural selection, but it's not everything. There's neutral drift. There's, uh, you know, spandrels quote unquote uh there's all this other mechanism that allows for non-adaptationalist evolution which is probably true and it is anti-teleological but the interesting part is that even the adaptationists are anti-teleological interesting for, for religious reasons not for scientific reasons so dawkins will say it appears that life is designed. It appears that there's a purpose to evolution. That is an illusion. Natural selection does not require any purpose. Something happens by chance. That thing makes you better at mating or living or whatever. And then it looks like it had a purpose, but it's not a real purpose. Yes, it is a real purpose. And what they're trying, what all of these theorists are trying to do, whether they're pro or anti-adaptationist, is to rule out any possibility of actual teleology, because, and, 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 you know, this is my pet beef, is that biology right now, all of biology right now, is absolutely 100% in the grip of an ideological premise, which is there is no God. Yeah. And what's fascinating, what was fat, and I, I was certainly part of that most of my career as an atheist. But when I became a Christian, I said to myself, well, maybe I'm kind of mirroring what you just said. If there is a God, <laughs> maybe that answers all our questions. I mean, not completely, because we still don't know the mechanisms. But it certainly answers, for example, if there's teleology, which there has to be, it's un- it's undeniable in biology and in evolution. If that exists, where did it come from? And I think it's I think what we're going to find out, but scientifically, if we get the chance, scientifically, we want to find out that where it comes from is from that forbidden idea that there is an outside agent that is responsible for all of this including yeah. life yeah so it's it's a slightly different way of looking at exactly the same thing you just said but you know it's 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 uh because i you know i i think that i think that it's not just teleology but you know the whole idea of agency in other words yeah every living thing has agency it does stuff it itself does stuff a worm crawls <laughs> 
a bacteria moves and, and engulfs. It has action, it acts. Nothing else acts. Volcanoes don't act, they, everything else reacts to some force or something else in, in the world. Uh, you know, maybe it's the wind or maybe it's pressure or some, but living organisms act. They have agency. Where does that come from? All right? Yeah. They come from the, it comes from the original agent who, 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 who created them. Now that's, but that's forbidden. See, I mean, the paper that I got published, which I talked about last time about the, the need for, um, you know, the, the, the need for accurate replication before you're going to have evolution. I had to write that paper very carefully <laughs> to make sure that there was no hint in it that what this implies is that there's some external agent that is because it's a scientific journal it's not going to take it and and you know i mean it there's some value to that prohibition i mean we can't have people saying well you know this happens because i dreamed that it would be a good idea so it happened you know i mean you know we, science is always going to remain uh, based on empirical, repeatable, reproducible data and evidence. No question about it. But what we're seeing now, and I'll repeat this because that's the theme I wanted to get across today. What we're seeing now is a inhibition of biological progress due to the opposite ideology, which is we can't admit anything into biological science that smacks or hints at teleology, agency, uh, design, anything that is, you know, not part of the current understanding of chemistry and physics of those laws. And the, the idea that there could be other laws that are only apply to biology is seems to be unacceptable. But I think, as you said, structural process, structural, uh, what is it called? <laughs> I just forgot the word. Structural, well, process structuralism, I process think. structuralism. Thank you. The process structuralism was invented in, in the last cent two centuries ago, right? In the 19th century, from Owen and, and, and it was a perf considered a perfectly fine scientific theory. And in fact, it still is. You know, Michael Denton wrote a, wrote a book about it. Uh, and but it's not it's not part of the mainstream in science because it doesn't go well with what most people think of as evolutionary theory and you know james uh james shapiro has also written uh about what he calls uh, natural engineering which is also somewhat not it's not it doesn't have any theistic uh things but it's it's you know and it, it has it follows different laws than than the, than the known laws that we know of and you know we we we've got to we've got to scrap this ideology that's you know, it started as anti theistic and it's now anti everything other than what we what we now know. Yeah. And and you know what I wanted to say, and I we we can do it a little bit later if you want, but you know the other areas where evolution just fails as we know it is to describe us. Mm -hmm. Human consciousness, human creativity, uh, you know, and 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 why does it fail? Well, there are evolutionary theories for why we are, why we have morality, why we have uh, ideas and genius ideas and things like that, and they all have to do with what you just said. They all have to do with spandrels. In other words, the uh, the concept is. Okay, there was there's an evolutionary advantage if you, to be nice to your children, right? If, if you're nice to your children and don't eat them, they'll grow up and they'll inherit your, whatever good characteristics you had and pass them on. And there's an evolutionary advantage to be nice to your brothers and sisters and maybe even cousins, you know, your kinfolk. It's called kin selection. Okay, so and 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 that idea of it's good to be nice to your close relatives acted like a spandrel in other words it began to spread in ways where it wasn't needed or it didn't have any advantage 
Yeah. Because it's not selectively advantage to be nice to the other tribe over there that's trying to eat your food. Right. It's better to be mean to them. <laughs> okay. But, you know, there is altruism around here. There are people who will go out of their way, like, you know, the Good Samaritan, to help people who have nothing to do with themselves. And it's not an accident to me that Jesus used that as one of his key parables. Yeah. Uh, where did that come from? The spandrel idea, this is what I call, this is not science. There's, there's, no, there's no gene for making a spandrel. <laughs> there's no spandrel protein. This is a made-up story. It's an ideological concept. It's, well, we've got to find some way to fit this, to stick this into the evolutionary box. And, and we can't do it with any actual science, because there is none. So we'll make up something. We'll call it a spandrel. And, and, then, and then we can say, well, you know, we, we have consciousness because it's better to know what's in front of us, whether it's a tiger or not. So that became a spandrel that allowed us to think philosophy and make the internet and do all this other stuff, right? Come on. <laughs> yeah. That's not science. That's a story. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's that's uh, that that echoes my thinking about about that is that, you know, how do you explain um, the, what you might call the origin of human uniqueness or human yeah. exceptionalism? Exactly. It's it's, you know, uh, it or even, you know, how do you explain the origin, the evolutionary origin of language or, or aesthetic sense? Right. right? These, this is all packaged together. Yeah, it's, it's the same. Language is a great example. I mean, it's one thing to be able to say, you know, a hundred words like buffalo there, kill, eat. Okay. And that's that's evolutionarily advantageous rather than making hand signs. Although gorillas do very well with, without language. They, they can communicate perfectly fine. But we can communicate a little better. But we don't need to be talking about, you know... <laughs> We don't need to be talking about basic philosophical or very complex philosophical, not to mention scientific or artistic ideas. Yeah. That that has no evolutionary advantage. It's probably a disadvantage. Yeah. Because we're, we, you know, you can imagine a, a group of people, a group of early humans sitting around a campfire and somebody starts talking about the purpose of life. You know, and he feels depressed and he's wondering why he's alive. And then other people say, what are you kidding? You know, you're eating. Shut up. Go mate, you know, <laughs> that's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, there's no science and, and what there is, is too much ideology. Yeah. So, Sai, you had something that you wanted to share with us then? Well, I mean, I was just going to talk about what I just said, uh, you know, okay. That, the, that there's something missing in evolutionary biology, and we know that because of what I just said and what you said is that, you know, origin of life is is not possible to understand based on what we now on the science we now know. Nor are you know human characteristics. Now I fully believe that Homo sapiens, as a species, you know, evolved from other genus of home of Homo. Uh, within the Homo genus, uh, and uh, and that was how we got started. But that's not how we are today. How we are today is totally mysterious. And it was only three hundred thousand years. So the idea that this was some mutations is very hard to believe. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I believe in a soul. I believe the soul is granted to us by God. I think that's what that's what it means in Genesis when. God, you know, in Genesis 2, when God breathed the spirit into, into Adam's nostrils, that's that's the creation of humanity. Uh, the evolutionary story is, is correct, but it only refers to our bodies. And we know we have animal bodies. The evidence is very clear, but we don't have we don't have animal souls and we don't have animal minds. That's way above that. So, you know, that's and how you make that into science, I don't know. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, but I think to your point, 
to not allow for the possibility of agency mm-hmm. being uh, uh, the ultimate explanation for some of these, you know, transitions in life's history, I, I think uh, robs people of that that ability to be to have the creativity to propose ways in which you could potentially study. Yes, you know some of these processes. Yes. You know, I've got there's a couple of friends who are also part of our the scholar community at Reasons to Believe. One is named Hugh Henry, one is Dan Dyke. Hugh Henry's a physicist, Dan Dyke's a Old Testament scholar, and they've written a few blog articles for us on this concept that they've dubbed hypernaturalism. Mm-hmm. And they have an interesting perspective where they argue, look, God isn't going to create laws of nature that he then violates to bring about his his creative purposes and that you know that he would probably work through the laws of nature but that we could detect things as being miraculous because the just right thing is happening at the just right time the just right magnitude that it would be what they call a hypernatural miracle where the laws of nature are not being violated but there's something suspicious going on to to produce some kind of an effect you know and, and i i've thought about that in light of the origin of life problem because when you look at the work that people are doing in prebiotic chemistry right they're trying to envision chemical routes that could produce some kind of product that would push the chemical evolutionary ball up the hill a little bit more but what these scientists are doing is they're functioning hypernaturally where they're utilizing the laws of nature, but they're able to rig the system in such a way that those laws of nature produce a desired outcome. Right. And so this is an example of where you could say agency was involved in the origin of life, but you now could study it scientifically through this concept of hypernaturalism, where you're saying, yes, indeed, there is agency involved, but that agency wasn't necessarily violating the laws of nature, but was working within those laws of nature, but in, in a hypernatural way where left to their own devices, that pro- chemical process or physical process would never happen or would not happen in a way that would be ultimately productive. Right. But if if there is an agent that is rigging things so that the outcome is pushing, again, towards that desired endpoint, then um, then it's something you could study, but also at the same time employ agency. And I suspect that's the way you're going to see genuine progress in 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 the you know the the problem the origin of life problem. Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, and you know that that's one of the things Jim Tour always points out is that you know people do things in the laboratory to you know, and, and it's not just him, many people have published on this uh but they're agents <laughs> with a purpose right and that's not how chemistry works in the in the in the prebiotic world there's no per they, they don't they're not trying to make life they don't know what they're doing they're just sitting there right so yeah well, I, I think that's that's a critical point but, but even when you look at something like let's say the cambrian explosion which i don't think there's a good evolutionary model to explain how you transition from single-celled organisms or colonial aggregates of cells to complex animals with these integrated, you know, uh, organ systems, right? Where you require this, you know, very elaborate process of of development to produce, you know, you know, multicellular, you know, complex animal forms. I just think that's another place where evolutionary theory breaks down. But when you think about the idea that, well, through a highly orchestrated, highly coherent gene duplication or genome duplication, coupled with, you know, again, very specific diversification, you could probably produce that kind of, you know, organism. But that... And and we we can do that type of thing in the lab through you know gene editing and and techniques in molecular biology, in in, in molecular genetics. So again, you could employ this concept of hypernaturalism, yeah. 
as a way to say there was indeed an intervention that took place to to generate that transition to you know complex organisms with body plans from single celled organisms and still do it in a way that's scientifically tractable so it just seems to me to your point that there's a, a philosophical impediment to making genuine progress in biology yeah i mean the, the example i like to use is the revolution in physics uh that started with quantum theory and and relativity and you know uh in physics there was in the 19th century there was they were basically done they had solved everything mechanics thermodynamics the only thing they couldn't figure out was the nature of light nothing made sense there but they had to come up with new stuff they had to come up with new mathematical ways of dealing with physics that had not been done before and you know this is way over my head i mean you know uh you and i are just simply poor biochemists so <laughs> we're not too good at this stuff but you know i know that re, you know Riemannian and laplacian and lagrangian all these different mathematical constructs were they were there in math but they had not been applied to physics problems and when they were we ended up with you know the schrodinger equation and all kinds of understandings that were brand new and we and we were able to understand the 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 physics the scientific physics of small particles and and the reality of nature but we're not doing that in biology because there's a prohibition it's not math I mean, we need mathematics that's by the way that's one of the other things i wanted to mention biology is surprisingly devoid of mathematics and i think the reason is because it's so complex but the other reason is we don't have the right laws <clears throat> so we don't know what mathematics to apply there really is no mathematical statement of the theory of evolution that's derived from any other law uh and you know reasons usually given are well it's so complicated you can't and, and we cannot define fitness fitness has a circular definition there's no definition of fitness that really fits <laughs> like a pun uh so these are these are basic scientific gaps in evolutionary theory not just to explain how things go but even in a scientific theory in general you want some mathematical law like there should be a law of natural selection and there are you know you can write down <clears throat> excuse me you can write down a version of the hardy weinberg equilibrium that includes a selection but that's just it's that's just describing what happens it's not really a basic a basic law that you, you know like gravity or <clears throat> newton's laws or any of the other laws that we know so that you know we're missing a lot of stuff and to to fill in all that missing stuff whether it's explanations or or laws or whatever we're going to we're going to need to expand just like the physicists did and we're going to have to expand into other areas you know it, it may be there may be something to vitalism after all <laughs> you know and we may have to bring that back that's real heresy but i can say that because i'm old <laughs> but we may have to bring back a lot of these concepts that were thrown out of biology with the bathwater. yeah 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 and I think that's probably all I really need to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I pre I think uh, we're probably uh, running out of steam here, or I think we've come, we've exhausted the topic to to some degree at least. Is there anything else you want to add bef before I bring the show to a close? Or no, I um, <clears throat> I'm uh, still working. I'm I'm actually in the process of. Uh, revising my probably one of my last maybe my last scientific paper on hypermutation so uh, I'm still doing that and I got another book that'll be coming out in about six months or so on science and faith and harmony so keeping busy yeah good good 
<laughs> well, you know, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us, Cy. You know, uh, we, you and I don't have necessarily agree on everything when it comes to science faith questions, but I think that's makes it fun to be yeah. in conversation, you know, where there's points, uh, su- at times, surprisingly points of agreement, uh, that I don't know that we would necessarily, uh, recognize right away, but it's fun to have that, this dialogue. And I'm, I just want to, you know, offer you a, a, an open invitation to, to come back on star right. Seven and God, anytime you want to, we, Love right. having you and enjoy your insights and 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 the conversation. And by all means, when your your new book is released, we definitely want to make sure we do something to to right. to introduce people to that book and and uh, yeah, talk to you a little bit more about some of your ideas. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Cy. I really appreciate you being here. Well, I love to be here and talk chatting with you. And I I'll just say. Thank God we don't agree on everything, because if we did, we'd probably be wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and bring it all to a close here. Uh, just want to say thank you so much for watching uh, Star Cells and God. I would just remind you uh, to make sure you go to our website, www.reasons.org. Check out uh, uh, our perspective on science faith issues and uh, explore some of the many, many resources we have at reasons.org. Follow us on social media, RTB underscore official. Also go to our YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe One, and subscribe and uh, set the notification uh, button so that you will be alerted the next time a new episode of Star Cells and God drops. And until next time, just want you to remember The more that we discover about science, the more that we have reasons to believe.